So I've been asked today to talk about uh, some um, resources I have in terms of uh, paediatric pain management. So I thought I would talk about uh, two videos that I've developed over the past uh, couple of years and some of the social media dissemination methods I've been using. Okay, so before we start, I know it's only a small group, so you don't have to answer me, but just, just think about it. So we're now encouraged to use social media in our knowledge disseminate, dis dissemination efforts. So I just wonder if you actually do that. Uh, so just have a think about that. If you use Twitter, or I know Kathy does, or YouTube, yep. or Facebook, or, or other ways that you're actually using knowledge dis um, social media. And the questions within that to consider are certainly relating to YouTube. So how can we best use YouTube to disseminate knowledge about pain treatment? And how can we effectively evaluate reach and impact of our videos? And how can we improve response rates to our surveys embedded in videos? And so you'll see as I go along why I'm actually um, asking upfront for you to consider these questions. So this all came about uh, in two ways. There's a very obvious knowledge to practice gap despite a lot of healthcare uh, provider education over many, many years. And then also by accident, while looking for suitable videos to use in my undergrad teaching, I came across what seemed like thousands of videos of babies screaming getting injections or getting heel answers. So it really made me think that we can actually get on um, on this bandwagon. And these thousands of videos that we seem to have found were despite a lot of evidence about immunisation pain. And in a nutshell, um, the recommendations are injection techniques, so rapid no aspiration, and that's certainly not what we see on the YouTube videos out there. And breastfeeding, sucrose and upright front to front holding for babies. And then for uh, neonates, there's a lot of also guidelines and uh, systematic reviews now. And in a nutshell, the three most um, effective ways to treat pain are breastfeeding. If you can't use that skin to skin, if we can't do that, if there's a separation with the baby from the parents or friends, uh, using small amounts of sucrose. And so I've sent you the uh, presentation, Lisa, and certainly I'm happy that it's uh, printed out. And I've, um, I've put a, a link here to one of the full text papers that actually show that despite this, we really don't use these strategies, at least in Ontario. So I thought if you can't beat them, join them, um, but do it uh, in a uh, systematic way. So what we did was, first of all, we looked at uh, developing uh, a review of methods for studying consumer health tube videos. And so we did this with our uh, Margaret Sampson, who's a librarian here at CHEO. And then we developed a protocol and we used that protocol to do our systematic review of YouTube videos showing pain management practices during vaccinations. And then we went ahead and posted our own video. So this one was posted in October 2013 and it shows breastfeeding and sucrose during vaccination. And our launch did coincide with the 2013 flu vaccination campaign. So it's very short and has simple captions in French and English. And, and we titled it The Secret to a Calm and Peaceful Vaccination. So I'm just going to show you this. Thank you. 
Sorry, it happens all the time. <laughs> and so uh, we did a uh, intensive knowledge dissemination uh, plan, and this was one of the posters that we put out, both online and uh, in hard copy. So 12 months later, we evaluated dissemination and the reach and impact and the survey responses to an embedded survey that we had linked from the, the YouTube video. And so basically it was seen by a lot of people, over 68,000 views in 12 months, but people didn't watch the whole video. In fact, they only watched two thirds and this was only one minute 35 seconds anyway. There were 68 comments, 245 likes and 17 dislikes and most of the dislikes were around anti-vaccination, not the pain management. And the survey was only completed by 162 viewers, so 0.24%. And so I get, I award myself first prize for the lowest response rate <laughs> ever for a survey. And I still hold that record, even though Christine Chambers is not far behind me. <laughs> so what I thought was, we really learned a lot from that, but I thought, okay, now we try again. I want to this time to show parents how to breastfeed, hold baby skin to skin and give sucrose for newborn infants during blood work. And I wanted this video to look much more professional. The first one I actually wanted to look like the more amateur videos that are actually out there on YouTube and then I wanted this one to be much more professional and from Chio. So it was just sort of a, a change in how I decided things should be done. And the reason this is important, because the most important risk factor for poor developmental outcomes is the number of painful procedures. And yet despite the evidence uh, that's strong, that's easy to use, easy to implement, feasible, free or cheap, we're actually still not treating pain in babies consistently. And as I was talking to Lisa before this started, at the last CAPC, there were actually a couple of presentations that could have really dealt with this. So Dr. Steve Miller uh, made very strong statements that um, the number of painful procedures is the strongest predictor of poor outcomes. And when I asked uh, him at the session about pain management, he was very evasive, totally avoided the question and we keep saying how many painful procedures babies have, but we don't treat it. So, and then there was a session by Mount Sinai on family integrated care, and they, uh, which sounded all very nice, and I was waiting for pain to be discussed, and they never did, so I asked the question at the end, and in fact it turns out that parents were asked to leave during blood test. So, pain treatment was not addressed and they really should have been. So I spoke to both these people and this panel and we'll see where that goes. So anyway, so this uh, video is now in English and in French and in Portuguese, Mandarin, Spanish, Arabic and Anoktitut and also in German. And so just looking at the results again of reach and impact just for the English and French at the moment after one year because they've been out for a year. Uh, so still quite a number of views. We pushed this out much less because I was developing the other language as we go. Uh, but still English had over 10,000 views in a year. Uh, and still not a lot of surveys though. Still only 200 surveys, so 1.8%. And they're still not looking at the whole video, especially in French. So this is now five minutes, so probably too long. But the French are only looking at one third of it, so they get very uh, impatient with my video. So overall, there's very large reach. We don't know the impact. That is, does viewing the video increase the use of pain, or treat, pain treatment? for the baby at the end. And we did have positive feedback from most, but not all. So this is where the Baby Friendly Initiative comes from, and this is actually who I'm presenting to uh, at, at three. So there was pu pushback from clinicians due to a perceived non-compliance if we use sucrose with the Baby Friendly Initiative. 
despite sucrose is not a food supplement and for babies who can't breastfeed, sucking on a soother can really result in additional calming. And so we really had to present a case to the BFI why sucrose, with or without sucking, did actually comply uh, with the Baby Friendly Initiative. So we went back to the drawing board. We partnered with BFI at the national level, and I should have done that right from the start. So you learn things as you go along. So uh, Kathy um, Venter is now a partner on our team and on our next grants and on a grant that we just got, in fact, to remake the vaccination video. So they requested a clear explanation that uh, breastfeeding and skin-to-skin -skin care are the first choices. And so what we did was we revised the video by inserting a disclaimer slide. So we put this in in English and in French, and in fact we've just done it in Portuguese as well. So it really clearly says that if you can't breastfeed and you can't do skin to skin, well then you can use sucrose and then to explain why you can use a pacifier. So once we did this, BFI have publicly endorsed the video and are actually going to use it in their uh, accreditation workshops and it's going to be something that hospitals will need to be able to uh, show now to be endorsed. So I'm just going to play this next version, which was the final version. When babies need to have blood tests or injections, there are things that we can do to help reduce pain during these procedures. Three things are most effective, breastfeeding, sugar water, and kangaroo care, also known as skin-to-skin -skin care. Breastfeeding can provide much more than nourishment to babies. It can also help reduce their pain and distress from blood tests. As you can see in this video, the nurse pricks the baby's heel for the blood sample while the baby is breastfeeding. As a mother, you can help by holding and breastfeeding your baby while the blood sample is being taken. In order for breastfeeding to have a maximum effect, it should be started about five minutes before the blood test. Ask your nurse or doctors about breastfeeding during blood tests or other needles, as well as other ways you can help babies during painful procedures. Kangaroo care can be done by mothers or fathers and is most effective for newborn babies, especially preterm. The babies are held skin to skin against their parents' chest. As you can see in the video, the baby is wearing only a diaper and is held in an upright position on the mother's bare chest, tummy to tummy. Fathers can also be the ones to hold their babies this way. To help keep your baby warm, the parent may wear a shirt or hospital gown with an opening in the front and a blanket over to wrap the baby. Having the baby in kangaroo care helps to reduce their pain and distress from blood tests. In order for kangaroo care to have the best effect, it may be started 15 minutes before the blood test. <clears throat> Ask your nurses or doctors about kangaroo care during blood tests or other needles, as well as other ways that you can help babies during painful procedures. Small amounts of sugar water called sucrose reduces pain during blood tests in babies up to one year old. As you can see in the video, the baby is given a small amount of sucrose from the syringe before the nurse pricks the heel, and again during the blood test. 
Sucrose is most effective when given around one to two minutes before the blood test, then again immediately before the procedure, and again throughout the procedure every two minutes or so until the procedure is completed. Ask your nurse or doctors about sucrose during blood tests or other needles and other ways that you can help babies during painful procedures. Okay, so uh, now where to? So the team, um, myself and our team and many people I talk to, um, I think that these videos which show best evidence are useful knowledge translation tools in multiple settings around the world. We really believe that. We've had a lot of uh, very positive feedback about that. But we still need to work out best ways to evaluate effectiveness in actually changing practice. It's one thing to have a lovely video that mothers see and staff see, but does it actually result in uh, use of these strategies, breastfeeding or skin to skin or sucrose during painful procedures? And also now where to? So we did receive CAHR funding to produce a new vaccination video. And in that, we'll also make sure that we show recommend injection technique. We're going to produce two, a separate video for breastfeeding and a separate video for sucrose. And that's because the World Health Organization now recommend breastfeeding for infants during immunization, but they don't recommend sucrose because obviously World Health Organization is really making recommendations at the, uh, you know, the minimal that we need to do for these babies in and mainly in developing countries. So sucrose, although it's cheap, does cost something and we didn't want to rely on people mixing it up and using, um, you know, uh, unsafe water. So we're sticking to just breastfeeding and that's what I'll be showing in that video. And the sucrose one will make two and that just won't be uh, pushed to the World Health Organization. And we know, and our next video again will be parent targeted, but again, we'll push it out for healthcare providers too because we've had such positive feedback that they're good learning tools. So in conclusion, YouTube is an effective way to disseminate knowledge uh, to large and widespread audience, but it's ineffective as a means of data collection through link viewer surveys. And we still don't know if YouTube videos can effectively translate knowledge into action and actually improve clinical care. Uh, so we really don't know the answer to these yet. But for babies, we do need to move knowledge into practice and preferably yesterday. Like we've, we've known this evidence for a long time. We just need to use it. And I'd just like to acknowledge my team and the funding and Bonnie Stevens and Sandy Dunn and the Bourne team for uh, their partnership throughout this whole uh, endeavour and everybody who's helped produce the videos. So thank you and I'll hand back to Lisa and I'm on for another 15 minutes if there's any questions or discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harrison. This is Samina. I, I appreciate your um, your insight and your explanation of what you're doing. Um, I do think Melissa and I, Dr. Chan here, we're, we were wondering while we were watching, uh, when you recommend the sucrose uh, before, two minutes before, uh, just before again and during, do you actually tell them to that when you're educating people to use the same two mils divided into one-third aliquots or do you tell them to give three separate doses? You know, all you need is really small amounts. We've just finished a study led by Bonnie Stevens and I guess the findings are what I've always known after giving thousands of doses. Really small amounts are needed. So it's a, it's just it's 0.1 mil maximum per dose. So, you know, draw it up and just or 
most places or many places now have toot sweets. So just you know, squeeze a little drop in, and yet one one syringe or one toot sweet throughout the uh, procedure. Thank you very much for that. Uh... For that, um, I think when uh, I certainly know for myself, when I've taught about using sucrose, I didn't think to specify how to give the two mils over the period of time before and during the procedure. So I really appreciate that. Um, does anyone and else two, have that question? And two two mils is too much. You just need a little bit. Like I used to say, just a drop. Hmm. But you know, really. 0.1 mil just to drop, and you could see in that little sucrose baby, we had given uh, him sucrose, uh, you know, the minute to two minutes beforehand, and then he cried again when we actually pricked him. Like in in tiny preterm babies, the effects last a lot longer, but in term babies and older babies, it's a really short time, and it wears off. So we need to just have the syringe or the tooth sweet there or whichever product there, and just dip the soother in again or thank you hi Denise this is Ashley um, in your first uh, vaccination video I saw you gave the list of your dissemination strategies um, and can you speak to which ones were like the most effective like did you get great uptake and positive feedback from the mommy blogs or the media release like was there any one strategy that stood out to you as like the best option yeah really good question I think we were lucky with the media release and we did time it with the flu vaccination even though two month old babies don't get it it's still just topical um, Probably the media release. Certainly there's some huge mummy bloggers, but I guess the media release goes to many more people. Mm -hmm. But really it's multi it's many ways. We also we had a student that was really keen to do poster drop offs and you never really know how well they go. People see so many posters and so I don't know and it's hard to tell. Um, you know, it would be a good question to ask, how did you find this? But again, it's really um, difficult to get people to fill in the survey. So, mm -hmm. but definitely uh, if you, and I know um, Christine has looked at some of her data and following a media release, she's certainly found, Christine Chambers has certainly found more hits following a new media release. So I would say, that's certainly worth putting your effort in, for sure. Okay. And then I just have a second question about, um, I know you said you had uh, poor survey response rates, but just in, in the comments and whatnot that you were getting with the videos, did you notice that if they were clinicians that were, were commenting, or was it just, um, was it parents, or just you, you weren't sure who it was? Um, no, it was a, a mix. So often the comments you don't know, certainly the surveys, we asked were they clinicians, were they answering with the hat on as clinicians or parents and we actually had more clinician surveys. With the comments often you can't tell but many were certainly, most were anti-vaccination and then some of them were commented on by pro-vaccination and medical staff as well and nursing staff that said that they were, you know, healthcare providers. So, but really the large majority were anti-vaccinators. Okay. Like All right. comments that, you know, sweet before the poison and or peace before the poison, you know, just the best way to treat pain, don't don't inject them, that sort of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So there, most of them were, were around that. Well, as my brother says, the uh, comment section in YouTube, on YouTube is where humanity goes to die. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Very informative. Yeah, thanks so much. Oh, thank you.